Если вопросов нет, тогда я перейду к... Предоставлю слово к следующему выступающему. Следующий спикер наш, госпожа Альмудена Фернандес, она является координатором академической программы по управлению государственным финансом при Латиноамериканском банке развития КАФ. И у Альмудены очень солидный опыт, многолетний опыт работы в Министерстве финансов Испании в должности старшего советника, а также работы в МВФ, в Департаменте по бюджетным вопросам в качестве советника по техническому содействию. В своей презентации Альмудена тоже в общих расскажет об основных изменениях, которые сейчас происходят в некоторых, во многих странах в системе управления государственными финансами, а также как идет процесс вот интегрирования ЦУР и зеленых аспектов в бюджетный процесс и в систему УГФ в целом. Пожалуйста, Альмудена, слово вам. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for to all the participants and authorities. It's a pleasure being part of this interesting workshop. I let me please share my my uh, screen. Mm. Okay, I will present um, as you said. Okay, I hope that you can see that. Well. Um, So my presentation is about the integration of the sustainable development goals and green aspects into the budget cycle. My presentation will have three different sections. The first one is about the challenges that public financial management practitioners are facing in the current economic context. The second section will analyze how public financial management can mainstream the sustainable development goals and climate change initiatives into the budget cycle. And finally, we will examine the concept of green taxonomy. So if we take a look at of the economic outlook, we see that the, the world is changing. From COVID-19, climate change, digitalization, and a diverging demographics, all the countries are confronting new challenges. The impacts of these challenges are being felt unevenly across all the countries in the world and will play out in their balance of payments, having important um, uh, effects on the global stability. So policymakers have the great responsibility of defining how to respond to risk and uncertainty, protect financial stability, strengthen inclusive growth, and manage high level of public debt and inflation. With the pandemic, global debt jumped by 14%, and public debt is equivalent now to almost 100% of the GDP worldwide. Countries with high debt burdens will need to work to avert fiscal and financing crisis. And large commodity exporters and importers will need to continue to build resilience to large price swings. There are quite different demographic pressures also in various parts of the world. And it's clear that income and gender inequalities are uh, widening. Only in 2021, we can see an increase of 65 to 75 million of people under uh, poverty. Climate change is also a risk worldwide and can lead to higher food imports and outward migration and in many affected countries. Last year alone, global energy related CO2 emissions grow by 5% to their highest levels in history. According to the World Economic uh, Outlook of the IMF, the world GDP is expected to grow around 4.4% in 2022 and 3.8% in 2023. And Central Asia is expected to be a bit above the average. Um, well, governments should look beyond safeguarding lives and livelihoods. As the world economy starts to emerge from COVID-19, The time will soon come to leaders for look beyond safeguarding lives and livelihoods and to set their sights on a more profound challenge that is bettering them. It is not easy as governments will need to manage deficits 
um, debt payment plans while finding the best way to support economic recovery. And particularly now that a lot of economies are, are starting to increase interest rates like the United States. So fiscal policy must revisit its traditional objectives that are stabilization, growth, and distribution of income, according to Musgrave, so governments can meet the challenge of attaining fiscal resilience as governments continue to grapple with the realities and consequences of the global pandemic. So the three goals that are essential in this, in this new era are growth, inclusion, and sustainability. The problem is that these challenges and these goals don't always pull in the same direction. So, do we, so we need to build a future that delivers the three of them. And this is a challenge, an incredible, difficult thing to do. So um, growth is elusive. Oh, excuse me, growth is elusive. And um, growth uh, uh, means that we can achieve prosperity, well-being, and pay the transition for a more sustainable and inclusive economy. Poverty is still endemic, and more than 600 people still live in, in extreme poverty. And third, ensuring a sustainable future will require massive investment. For example, the International Energy Agency estimates that net zero emissions might require investments of almost 5 trillion each year by 2030 and 4.5 trillion US dollar per year by 2050. While many investments would produce a return, their financing or pricing is not yet set up. In this context, leaders must define sound fiscal policy objectives, clear medium and long-term plans, and improve their public financial management institutions as a prerequisite to warranty a fair and sustainable growth. Now let's move to this slide to examine the concepts of fiscal policy and public financial management and understand its role in this uh, context. Public financial management, PFM, is an evolutionary concept. It is a set of evolving rules, procedures, and processes whose ultimate aim is to assist governments fulfilling their objectives. It thus remains a means to an end, whose main goal is shed light on the trade-offs among fiscal policy objectives in terms of their relative cost and benefits. PFM is what makes fiscal policy work. Fiscal policy outlines what to do, it asks what fiscal measures to take to reach an objective, and public financial management deals with how to do. It asks how to implement fiscal measures so that they are successful. Without a strong public financial management, fiscal policy will never succeed. In the months and years ahead, public financial management practitioners will need both resilience to ride out shocks and agility to exploit emerging opportunities. The next normal requires then resilience. And public financial management systems must adapt to current circumstances as they can work as a catalyst for change. The key is looking beyond traditional practices and contributing to deliver extraordinary impact. The COVID-19 pandemic has put PFM systems to the test globally. An effective PFM will revert to a faster recovery and exit from the crisis and direct it to the priority objective. We can say that PFM faces two big challenges, process challenges and underlying challenges. In the first group, we have how to apply fiscal policy ensure the availability of funds, what's the best way to control and warranty the continuity of operations. For example, many countries have relaxed or even exempted the application of fiscal responsibility laws without imposing limits on deficits, debt, or spending rules in order to carry out expansionary expending policies and ensure that the funds are available on time for the units providing services. In addition to the challenges linked to, linked to processes, we can talk about the underlying challenges. 
they analyze where the most relevant gaps have occurred and use the fiscal and budgetary policy instruments to adopt the key measures to achieve a sustainable and resilient recovery. Program different impact scenarios and work deeply on the output. Budget planning will have even a greater role in this period. And follow up on the results through performance indicators will be essential. It is clear then that governments need to prepare and strengthen the capacity of their PFN systems in order to respond to all these challenges. So what is the role of PFM in this context? The large packages announced by governments will add trillions of US dollars to global GDP. For example, the European Union announced the Next Generation EU Recovery Plan and the United States, the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Well, these two will have an impact of 4.6 trillion of US dollars between 2021 and 2026 if fully implemented. Sound PFM system are key players to deliver successful recovery packages and mitigation plans. Countries agree that joint actions are required and the role of international organizations to align strategies and develop mechanisms to address new issues are very strategic. In this context, Two instruments are particularly important, and they are the Agenda 2030 and the Climate Change Commitments. So you already know a lot about the Agenda for 2030 and all the Sustainable Development Goals that, that were adopted by all the United Nations member states in, in 2015. In the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are an urgent call for action by all countries in a global partnership. At the heart of the agenda, there are five critical dimensions, people, prosperity, planet, partnership, and peace that are known as the five P's. The 17 sustainable development goals are interconnected, which means that success in one affects the success of others. There are tools, methodologies, and approaches in support to the implementation of the SDG. And high-level political forum on sustainable development is the core United Nations platform where government, civil society, and actors can review the implementation of the agenda. A lot of countries have already, almost 50, I think, have already uh, presented the voluntary national reviews despite the impact of COVID-19. And um, also there is a platform to track all the, uh, uh, all the progress done. So uh, today progress is being made in many places, but overall action to meet the goals is not yet advancing at the speed or scale required. Public budgets are amongst the most powerful instruments for government to address the, the agenda for 2030. And mainstreaming SDGs into budgets cannot be effective if the budget process remains unaffected. But also, mainstreaming SDGs into budgets is not a single exercise by one actor. It requires a concentrated effort of many actors, implementing various initiatives over a period of time. I will, I will move to the next slide because this was already explained also by Surem. And, and this slide will be, will be also a quick because you can see here the impact that the different areas of the budget cycle have due to the implementation of the SDGs and the agenda for 2030. So as you can see, the whole budget cycle is involved from planning and fiscal framework, budget preparation, budget execution, accounting and reporting, and of course, control and audit. So in, if we move to speak about a climate change, we see that the impacts of climate change are already very visible and happening worldwide. It is um, so sad that now we are not surprised when we see the news and read about storms, floods, and wildfires that are intensifying around the world. Advances in tackling them are leading to cleaning air, creating good jobs, restoring nature, 
and at the same time unleashing economic growth. Despite the opportunities, countries are not acting fast enough. It is crucial that countries speed up climate action. Two weeks ago, the United Nations Secretary General highlighted that keeping the 1.5 alive requires a 45% reduction in global emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by mid-century. Economies largely, largely based on oil, gas, and petrochemicals have great responsibility in transitioning to a green economy by reducing emissions and building climate resilience. New trends include investments on solar renewable energy, electric vehicles, low carbon economy, and green hydrogen. There are 12 of the 17 sustainable development goals that directly involve taking action on climate change, in addition to climate change having its own goals. Let's take a look now to the international actions taken in uh, regarding climate change. In 2015, United Nations leaders reached the Paris Agreement and this agreement explicitly establishes a cycle of ambition. Countries will revise their emission targets, known as nationally determined contributions, and communicate them every five years. The Paris Agreement has three key elements. First, limit the average global temperature increase to uh, two uh, degrees and achieve net zero emissions by mid-century. Second, in case release resilience and adaptation to climate impacts certain to occur. And third, align financial flows in the world with these objectives. Five years after the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November 2020 had two headline outcomes. The first, the Glasgow Climate Pact, and then the Paris Rule Book. So the, Glas the Glasgow Climate Pact was agreed after negotiations, and it is a series of decisions and resolutions that build on the Paris Accord, setting out what needs to be done to tackle climate change. However, it doesn't stipulate what each country must do, and it is not legally binding. The Paris rule book gives the guidelines on how the Paris Agreement is delivered. A focus on a, a, a COP26 was to secure agreement between the Paris Agreement and uh, the Paris signatories and how they would set national contributions to reduce emissions. This a rule book includes agreements on an enhanced transparency framework for, re, for reporting emissions, common timeframes for emission reductions targets and mechanisms and standards for international carbon markets. It is really a very important milestone because it establishes a real action plan so, so it will be easier for countries to follow up on the progress. We have four main goals and two key concepts. The four main goals are secure global net zero by mid-century and keep 1.5 degrees within reach. Second, adapt to protect communities and natural habitats. Third, mobilize finance. Developed countries must deliver on their promise to raise at least 100 billion US dollars in climate finance per year. And international financial institutions must play their part too. And four, work together to deliver because governments, businesses, and civil society can deliver goals faster, and they are mutually involved, and their action can find easily synergies. Around 7% of the world's economy is now committed to reaching net zero emissions. More than 80 countries have formally updated their, um, their plans, and all the uh, G7 countries have announced a lot of measures on the path to net zero emissions by 2050. The two key concepts are adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation means anticipating the adverse effects of climate change and taking appropriate action to prevent or minimize the damage they can cause 
or taking advantage of opportunities that may arise. Some examples include large scale infrastructures that, that uh, can include changes, for example, building defense to protect against a sea level rise or behavioral shifts such as individuals reducing their food waste. In a sense, adaptation can be understood as the process of adjusting to the current and future effects of climate change. The other concept is the mitigation. Mitigation means making the impacts of climate change less severe by preventing or reducing the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Mitigation is achieved either by reducing the sources of these gases, for example, by increasing the share of renewable energies, or by enhancing the storage of these gases, for example, by increases, increasing the size of forest. Uzbekistan plans to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 35% in 2030, in, in comparison to the levels recorded in 2010. The climate in Central Asia was changing twice as fast as in other regions due to the drying up of the Aral Sea. And Uzbekistan is implementing a comprehensive strategy for the transition to a green economy and a program for the development of, renew of renewable, renewable and hydrogen energy. These plans must be part of the budget and the, of the budget cycle, and indeed will we, we'll have an impact in all the PFN system. So this is what we call move or implement green public financial management. Green PFM means to gradually adapt existing PFM practices to make them environment and climate sensitive. International organizations are constantly developing toolkits and guidelines to highlight its importance. Virtually no countries have comprehensive green PFM systems, but several have rolled out a few of, of or several components. In this figure, you can see how it works because you can see the relationship between the green fiscal policies and the green PFM. So a green fiscal policies support governments integrated strategies to combat climate change. For example, we, we can find put in place a carbon tax, reform energy subsidies, or invest in resilient infrastructure. If we move to the green public financial management measures, they, they want to ensure that green policies are effective and funded within fiscal constraints. So for example, we have set analytical requirements for the green impact of new policies, ensure accountability for the climate impact of fiscal policy choices, integrate climate change in infrastructure project assessment, and the system is also um, um, sustained by what we call the green bonds. The green bonds are funds for climate change projects. There are a lot of countries with examples on with with, with, with initiatives and examples among uh, fiscal policies and green PFM. For example, we have in, in New Zealand legal foundations for green PFM. We have in France a budget toolkit that is going to be, to be also presented in this workshop. Uh, we have also the, the tagging methodologies that, that, was, or that were already mentioned, um, and also different climate targets in the national development plans or in, uh, in transparency reportings in, in many countries today. And as I pointed out earlier, changes in the annual budget are not su sufficient because all the budget cycle must be involved. In this figure, you can see the um, green PFM framework developed by the International Monetary Fund. And it includes the different actions in the budget cycle that can be taken into consideration. For example, adapting the existing PFM laws, also including climate objectives and targets when preparing the, the annual budget, a long-term sustainability analysis, 
also the, uh, it is possible to do budget analysis only focus on green initiatives or climate change actions and uh, of course tagging climate change uh, expenditure and, and green performance among others. Also, the World Bank has recommendations for ministries of finance, um, and they are establishing three areas. The first area it would uh, mean to set a mid-term budget framework for climate action that, that will be part of the budget documents that go to the parliament for the budget approval. Then the second area is about transparency and accountability to inform resource allocation decisions. And the third area is about effectively receive and distribute external finance. And in the last part of my presentation, I want to briefly examine the concept of green taxonomy. So the lack of clarity about which activities and assets can be defined as green has long posed a barrier for scaling up green finance. A green taxonomy system identifies the activities or investments that deliver on environmental objectives, helping drive capital more efficiently toward priority environmentally sustainable projects. The guide can help banks and other financial institutions originate and structure green banking products, for example, loans, credits, and warranties. And it can also help investors identify opportunities that comply with sustainability criteria for impact investments. Many jurisdictions are developing taxonomies worldwide. The granularity, scope, criteria, and environmental objectives of these taxonomies can vary greatly. The European Union recently approved the green taxonomy and seems the most advanced and ambitious to this date. Several other jurisdictions have also addressed sustainable uh, taxonomies. For example, we have in China, the Green Bone Endorsed Project Catalog that was approved in 2015. In Japan, we have the, the Japan Green Bond Guidelines that were approved in 2017 by the Ministry of Environment. And in the Netherlands, we can find, yes, the, the okay, the legislative approach, approach to green uh, lending since 1995. And the, well, here you can see that there are also another initiatives, for example, the Climate Bonds Initiative and the Global Reporting Initiative. The Global Reporting Initiative is independent, but it remains a collaborating center of UNEP and works in cooperation with the United Nations Global Compact and is mainly used as a basis of corporate extra financial reporting for corporate social responsibility or environmental, social and governance report. And finally, in this slide, you can see a, an example of the European Green Taxonomy that was approved in June 2020. Um, in this case, the regulation will enter into force between um, la well, last year and this year. And, and the idea is to define six environmental objectives that identify the purposes of the taxonomy that are climate change mitigation, adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention, and protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystem. For an economic activity to be considered taxonomy compliant, it must contribute substantially to one or more of the objectives, do not significant harm to any other environmental objective, and comply with minimum social safeguards. So that was, that was all, and I hope that you enjoy the presentation, and I will be happy to, to reply any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое, Альмудена, за очень интересную презентацию. Это как раз, я думаю, для большинства участников, которые являются представителями финансовых органов, Министерства финансов, было очень интересно понять вот плавный переход, как вопросы зеленого развития, климатические вопросы должны и будут интегрироваться в бюджетный процесс.
Коллеги, если у вас есть вопросы, пожалуйста, можете задать. Коллеги, которые онлайн, тоже можете поднять руку или же по чату отправить. Я понимаю, что сегодняшний семинар он очень насыщен, очень много информации, очень много новой информации, поэтому, возможно... Можно, да, вопрос? Да, пожалуйста, Диора, пожалуйста. Да. Спасибо большое. Это Диора Кабулова, программа развития ООН. Я бы хотела узнать по поводу зеленой таксономии. Интересно, на каком этапе страны начинают вводить зеленую таксономию и какое министерство или ведомство обычно лидирует и принимает решение, какую именно таксономию принимать в стране. Спасибо. Okay, well, um, it's, it's very interesting because a green taxonomy is basically um, a new concept that has been evolving very recently. And, and what, what I can see is that uh, for countries, it's easier to implement green taxonomy when there is a common framework launched by an international organization. So that's um, in one of the slides, um, I, I said that uh, there are um, these, for example, European taxonomy and also another initiatives, for example, the climate bonds initiative and also common principles for climate mitigation, finance tracking, and for adaptation finance tracking. Uh, also, there is the sustainability accounting standards board that, that has been developed by the, by, by the IPSAS board and uh, the global reporting initiative. So basically, most of the countries or the majority of countries, I must say, um, use one of these um, as a guideline or as a base, because they are well known by a lot of uh, companies and industries. Because at the end of the day, uh, green taxonomies are very useful for policymakers, but also for corporates, financial institutions, retail investors, because it's something that that um, that gives um, the the all the all the key players and actors the sense of what are sustainable uh, businesses and what are sustainable actions, right? So. Um, um, The, the countries that have a specific green taxonomy uh, are, are obviously just um, a few examples, but if you, if you see the dates when they are starting to, to work on that, we can see the Netherlands that was 1995, so it was uh, one of the pioneers, and then uh, the examples of Japan and, um, and also uh, China are from mid-2010. Um, there is um, a paper also from the OECD, which um, I can I can forward to you if you are interested because it examines the different the different case studies, including, for example, France and including uh, these cases of Japan and China. And I think that it is interesting to to read about the um, the story, right, under this country. But in the other countries, for example, of the of Europe. Uh, the, the need of having the green taxonomy is very recent and it was after the approval in June of 2020 of the European Union green taxonomy package when they started to develop and, and basically to include the, the European uh, norms into the, into the legal specific uh, framework. Спасибо большое. И вторая часть вопроса, какое ведомство обычно лидирует? Почему я спрашиваю? Потому что, например, есть инициатива по зеленым облигациям, mm -hmm. да, которая тоже должна использовать mm -hmm. зеленую таксономию. Зелеными облигациями занимается mm -hmm. ну, Министерство финансов. Есть проекты, зеленые проекты. Ими занимаются линейные ведомства. Да? Это, например, в нашем случае это комитет по экологии, окружающей среде, это узгитромет и так далее. Uh -huh. То есть таксономии в итоге будут использовать все министерства ведомства. Как она должна разрабатываться? Кто должен лидировать? Uh -huh. Этот вопрос тоже интересен. Yes. In the case of, for example, uh, there is a... Uh, um, Dichotomy, we can find 
uh, countries where it is led by environmental uh, mi or energy ministries, for example, the case of Japan, but in, for example, in the European countries, it is usually lead, led by the ministries of economy or economy and finance if they are together. Because the Ministry of Economy is usually the one that has the rules um, in terms of green bonds and, and uh, green finance. So, so at the end of the day, it's the ministry who sets the criteria, okay? But of course, uh, these actions, um, these changes are not uh, implemented alone. I mean, usually there is a lot of a coordination between one, one kind of the line ministries and the Ministry of Economy and Finance. But I must say that in general, what I have found is that mostly ministries of economy take the lead. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Коллеги, есть еще вопросы? Пожалуйста, Бзеде Хаваризбор, Саккизиус Хабурнич, Сонли Вазар, Лемахина Скарору, Баркору Рожлян, Шмасад Ларатас Хленген, Ума, Читил, Практики, Дешу, Униет, Курсат, Кичбуй, Чуглян, Канакадар, Буркенкритне, Ульчулар, Бильгила, Пуледам, или Алохада, Буджет Джаронда, Буджет Непрограмма, Асост, Бильгила, Надам, Цель, Махсат Леяни. Рахмат. Okay, so according to, well, um, I, can, I can tell you about my experience, for example, in when we launched the, the SDGs in Spain, okay? So in that case, um, we have, you, when you have the budget and the programs in the budget, it is very difficult at the beginning because this, this um, 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 programs have had a trend, right? So, so they are not new and they are not created because of the agenda for 2030. So you face the problem of uh, tagging something that already exists, okay? So what we did was to, to create a, 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 a working group, including all the line ministries, and to share a, and, and to create a platform so they can introduce data and, and of course, it was a relationship between the, the Ministry of Finance and the line ministries, reviewing all the information submitted and um, taking into consideration that the indicators are, have been already approved by United Nations. So, so basically you have the targets and you have the indicators and connected to the, to the SDGs. So basically what you need to do is to review your system and try to include the information um, accurately okay so uh, the first step was for the for to, like to create this environment of, of coordination and the the ministry of finance was in charge of receiving and reviewing all the documentation and in this regard we had the the specific analyst working with the specific mi line ministries so they know perfectly they are part of the Ministry of Finance, but they knew perfectly how um, what what were the initiatives under the different pro programs of the budget. So so that was the way to launch that. And then what was very important was to create the the sustainable and development goals report that goes with the annual budget to the Parliament, because this document um, was. Um, um, used to show the commitment of Spain with the with the sustainable development goals. So line ministries knew that it was not just another requirement of the Ministry of Finance, but it, it has a, an important a role to play, right? Because it was then uh, shown to the to the parliament and, and of course it was uh, the results were more um, 
follow up in comparison with other uh, programs. And, and you also asked about the, the case of the Netherlands, right? But in the case of, of the Netherlands, I am um, not fully, um, I mean, I know that I mentioned that for in the in the green taxonomy, but um, to be honest, I will need to to review the case of Netherlands. But I will be happy to share with you any presentation or document that I find if you are particularly interested in that example. Спасибо большое, Альмудена. Да, еще вопрос, пожалуйста, представьтесь, пожалуйста. So, good afternoon. My name is Shahru Shankov from Minister of Finance, head of division budget policy and uh, formulation of consolidated budget. Mm -hmm. So, thanks for interesting presentation. And uh, I'm interested in the, the real side of the implementation of green budgeting or SDG goals with the uh, budgeting process. So in one of the slides, you mentioned that uh, it's not enough to making some amendments in the annual budget, but it should be the whole in, included in the whole process of mm -hmm. budgeting process, right? So, yes. but the, uh, every time so we can start the new uh, reforms in the budget process, but the, every time we meet with the issue of um, uh, lack of capacity, so some of us can know about the new reforms and uh, may uh, participate in these uh, kind of seminars and learn from <laughs> the experts, but uh, it's difficult to deliver uh, this uh, knowledge. Uh, even the delivering knowledge is not enough sometimes because uh, even the reading the something, if we have not any the practice, is difficult to uh, be included in the process. So my main the question is the how the how to act at the beginning of this reform uh, based on your based on your experience. So mm -hmm. in the budget in the budget process we include not only the central level of the let's say the line ministries or minister of finance minister of economy. The, we also include the regional um, financial authorities and the uh, other participants from the regions. So, uh, because the, the main issue is uh, at the bottom side, from the top, uh, we just can, uh, as judging from the top is uh, not uh, every time is correct. So mm -hmm. that's why I want to know the how to uh, uh, include them in this process. Uh, thinking that there is uh, there is no any capacity so how to start thank mm -hmm. you yes that's a super interesting um, comment because um, it's it's a really an important issue and not only in emerging economies but also in in advanced countries because uh, it happened to us as i said at the beginning like line ministries we're not providing the information, for example, to the general directorate of, of budget or the Ministry of Finance, because they they were not part of the of the agenda for 2030. And I must say that, for example, at the beginning, with the with the Paris Agreement in 2015, it was like something that that was part only of the Ministry of of ecological transition and, and the Ministry of Finance found that it was not part of, of the Ministry of Finance. But I think that um, after these years, uh, countries are learning that the actions need to be uh, 360 degrees and, and it's something that, um, that everybody um, or, or at least in in all the in all the international organizations documents and when you read about the economic literature and literature on PFM, it is essential to take on board everybody. So, what are the mechanisms that we can put in practice? Well, well, for for regionals and um, something that I have seen that is um, important is to have, for example, or to create networks or share points, because. When the Ministry of Finance take the lead on something and can share, for example, templates, presentations, now after the COVID-19, 
um, we can use, for example, technologies and we can, we can have a virtual meetings or virtual capacity building training groups and create a network because um, I think that like five years ago, it was very unrealistic thing that, that we can use technology and digitalization to create this kind of, of uh, programs. But now I think that everybody is uh, more used to it and, and it is easier. Then, um, so, so for the relationship with, um, I must say that, for the relationship with line ministries, um, because uh, uh, this uh, kind of, um, activities and uh, workshops and so on can also work uh, and it's important also to include the um, the commitment of the government in launching one document or something that goes to parliament and have a, um, uh, you know, that, it, that is public information. Because um, according to my experience, it also motivates all the, all the key players and they are more engaged when they know that, that they are contributing to, to something that it is real, right? Because it is not just providing the information like another requisite, but to, to give something that will be published, will go to, to also the, the other, other countries or the, the uh, public society in general. And, but I say that it's, it's very complicated, uh, for example, in, in rural areas or in places where you don't have a lot of um, people that have the knowledge or the time to, to to understand so the the easier and the more simple that you make the things the better because when somebody understand using just simple words and and i mean they they really understand the the feeling so if you go and and tell um, some some people that don't have the capacity and you start speaking about green taxonomy they will probably will not understand anything but you really need to start from the beginning for example you have in your country the the rlc catastrophe so if you start with that, for example, they will know that climate change is important because at the end of the day, um, they are suffering the consequences. So my, my suggestion would be to start like from the beginning and to make things the, the simple and the easier possible to, to get their engagement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just uh, would like to add a comment uh, uh, on this question because it's a very interesting and important question. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my feeling is that SDG and green budgeting is uh, as well a, a way to uh, uh, modify the, the relationship and the dialogue between the Ministry of Finance and the line ministries. Uh, in fact, in the classical way, the relationship is just about money and uh, the line ministry is saying we want more money and the Ministry of Finance saying there is no money. And uh, so it's a kind of a, a mechanical opposition between these two uh, ministries. While in fact, when you discuss uh, more on uh, the target SDGs green budgeting, you are more in a kind of uh, collaboration between the two uh, ministries, the Ministry of Finance and the Line Ministry, and is it how with the money available we can do better together. So it's really about improving the, the coordination within the, the different ministries and the government. So the, this, uh, in, a, in a way, it's a kind of uh, an additional asset for uh, the budget mm -hmm. preparation. Спасибо большое, господин Копа. Спасибо за комментарий. Уважаемые коллеги, спасибо большое, Альмудена, за презентацию интересную и за вопросы, которые задали коллеги. Если позволите, тогда я перейду к, нашему следующему, к нашей следующей презентации.